This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for building a website and growing your online presence. More on them later. The past few decades have been extremely kind to one of Earth's planetary neighbors, Mars, the Red Planet. Yet, it wasn't always so, for there is another planetary body in our solar system which for many years fascinated scientists far more. With the planetary mass and radius incredibly close to that of Earth and a surface gravity of just 0.9 g's, it was Venus, named after the Roman god of love and beauty, that was supposed to be humanity's best hope for interplanetary study and perhaps even colonization. For decades before spaceflight began, Venus had been at the center of hot academic debate. Given the limitations of technology in the early 20th century, not much was known about Earth's sister planet. However, what was known was frankly intriguing. Early spectrographs, scans of the absorption lines in light bouncing off the atmosphere of the planet, revealed what appeared to astronomers to be seas of carbonated water, but no telescope could pierce the thick cloud layers that enveloped the mysterious planet. Oh, we know now that Venus has a crushing atmosphere of carbon dioxide 90 times higher in pressure than the Earth herself, the result of a runaway greenhouse effect that boiled the planet beginning some 300 million years ago. But in 1961, we didn't know any of that. Imagine a planet just weeks away by rocket ship with a sea of seltzer water and, for all we knew then, a worldwide living ecosystem of exotic plants and animals. It's no surprise then that it was Venus, not Mars, and not even the the moon that became destination numero uno, the first extraterrestrial body that humans ever probed. It was with bated breath that Soviet scientists waited for word from Venera 1, which approached Venus for a flyby on the 19th of May 1961, a full eight years before America would land on the moon. It was meant to be a moment of triumph, but it ended in a whimper. The 643.5 kilogram probe lost radio contact with Soviet controllers and returned no data. An ambitious project, especially considering that the Soviets had launched Sputnik just four years earlier, Venera 1 and her sister craft Venera 2, which also failed, carried a raft of scientific instruments intended to give Venus a closer look. On board was a flux gate magnetometer, two ion traps to measure the solar wind, micrometeorite detectors, and Geiger counters, as well as other instruments meant to study cosmic radiation in the vicinity of Venus. It was something of a dry run, a means of testing the waters before the USSR would send follow-up probes to approach the planet itself. Seemingly undeterred, Soviet scientists immediately set to work on Venera's successes, eventually developing a series of 16 groundbreaking interplanetary probes which would afford humanity its first glimpses of a brand new world. The result would be incredible for science, but in another way, well, incredibly disappointing for humanity. Along the way, the 23-year Venera program, Venera meaning Venus in Russian, by the way, became the first interplanetary probes, the first spaceships to make course corrections in deep space, the first hard landings on another planet, the first soft landings on another planet, and it produced some of the first images and radar maps of another world. Venera's 1 and 2 launched as a pair, both failed to maintain contact with the Earth, but Soviet planners learned a lot from the attempt, and by 1966, Venera 3 had reached Venus, crash landing on the 1st of March of that year. This probe, weighing about one metric ton, was designed to study Venus's atmosphere. Yet, here again, though it reached Venus intact, its scientific instruments failed during atmospheric insertion and returned no valuable data. No matter though, in October of 1967, Venera 4 successfully did measure the Venusian atmosphere for the very first time, and what it returned was an unpleasant surprise to mission scientists. It determined that the atmosphere of Venus was composed primarily of carbon dioxide, and though scientists initially believed that it had crash-landed on the surface, later analysis and some data from the US Mariner 5 spacecraft which flew by Venus the next day, not coincidentally, revealed that the probe had failed far up in the Venusian atmosphere. This was another terrible sign for Earth's neighbor that the atmosphere was so thick to make it virtually impenetrable. 
Now just let me interrupt today's video to tell you about our fantastic sponsor today, Squarespace. Have you ever wanted to start a website but have been put off by the thought of complicated coding? Well, worry no more. The Squarespace allows you to stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything. Products, content, and even your time. Absolutely no coding required. Their easy-to-use drag-and-drop model of creating a website means that anyone can build their dream website in no time at all. The powerful analytics tools provided by Squarespace give you amazing insights into who visits your site and how they interact with your content. This includes page views, traffic sources, audience geography, and more. Figure out what is drawing your audience in and capitalize on the premium data that's provided to you. Squarespace also comes with powerful blogging tools, allowing you to share anything from stories, photos, and videos to simple updates for your fans. You could connect your social accounts and automatically push website content to your social media channels, schedule your posts, and make your content work for you. If you're still not convinced, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash megaprojects, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to today's video. It was here that the Soviet Union scientists were forced to switch tack. NASA had publicly announced findings in 1967 that the atmosphere of Venus, as measured by the Mariner probes, was at least 75 to 100 times greater than Earth's. And it was also composed largely of the greenhouse gas CO2, producing hellish conditions on the surface and making the prospects of reaching the planet, well, rather dim to say the least. However, having invested so much in its initial planning of Venera, the USSR was not ready to just throw in the towel. They took up the challenge, following it up with Venera's 5 and 6 in May of 1969, just as the Americans were first preparing their moon landings. Determined to reach the surface of Venus and save face in the interplanetary space race, the Soviets strengthened the Venera design, this time dropping 405 kilogram capsules from the main pair of spacecraft designed to reach Venus's surface at all costs. The new capsules also contained chemical experiments to measure the Venusian atmosphere, as well as parachutes to help the probes reach as far down as possible into Venus's clouds. They carried pressure sensors with a range up to 40 atmospheres, as well as optical measurement devices meant to provide further intelligence as to how thick the atmosphere would become on the surface, and thermometers as well to measure the atmospheric heat. But sadly, Venera's 5 and 6 never made it close to the surface. Both failed in just under an hour, measuring an unbelievable 320 degrees Celsius atmosphere that was 26 times thicker than the Earth's at an altitude of over 10 kilometers. By now, in 1970, dreams of a gentle water landing in a habitable Venusian sea of soda water had been utterly dashed. Venus, it transpired, was a hellish world of megastorms, sulfur rain, and heat that could melt lead. So, naturally, the Soviets continued to send probes now with almost the express purpose of reaching the surface of Venus. Venera 7 was launched in August 1970. The probe was ridiculously overbuilt, designed to take up to 180 times Earth's atmosphere, the deep-sea probe-like lander being little more than a giant cannonball with a few minor scientific instruments on board. About a meter in diameter, this probe was composed largely of titanium and ceramic materials, but unfortunately, the designs have now been lost. It's Amazing what happened to these things in the pre-digital age. The probe also came equipped with a special onboard cooling system that could chill the lander to a frigid minus 8 degrees Celsius before insertion to the Venusian atmosphere. The parachute managed to open at 60 kilometers, and atmospheric testing began. After six minutes, the parachutes melted, and the probe entered an uncontrolled freefall. It struck the surface at about 60 kilometers an hour, the low relative speed due to the very thick atmosphere at the surface. Amazingly, though it would take many months to discover this, Venera 7 actually continued to function on the surface of Venus, with its data tapes continuing to transmit data back to its mothership for an additional 23 minutes. Its sister probe, the Venera 8, also landed on the surface and transmitted similar data for about an hour. This success helped Soviet planners to find out that the surface of Venus was an incredible 475 degrees Celsius with a surface pressure of 9 MPa, or about 88 times that of the surface of the Earth. This data was enough to confirm that there could never exist any kind of ocean on the surface of Venus, nor probably life of any kind. The planet was a hell world with an atmospheric water composition of under 1%. So, well, the Soviets decided to send some more probes.
It became important, particularly given the American dominance in the space race with successful moon landings and planned missions to Mars with Viking landers later in the 1970s, for the Soviet Union to demonstrate its scientific prowess by retrieving the ultimate prize, a picture of the surface of Mars. In order to achieve this, a series of nine additional probes would be sent to Venus between 1970 and 1983. The Venera probes were considerably beefed up to try and land more complex scientific instruments and cameras. This began with Venera 9, the Venera probes having been beefed up even more to survive on Venus's surface. Venera's 9 through 12 weighed approximately 5 tons, and each included a similar transfer and relay bus which would remain in orbit, transmitting their surface data back to Earth. The craft's entry probes were contained within a spherical heat shield, optimized for surface operations and cooled using onboard refrigerator units that supercooled the interior electronics with liquid coolant to help them withstand the heat of the surface. They also abandoned any attempt to land with parachutes, favoring instead a harder landing on a crush ring designed to keep the lander upright and preserve the interior electronics. Its atmospheric braking parachutes, which would open tens of kilometers above the surface, were expected to melt and disappear by the time the probe reached 10 to 12 kilometers up. Venera 9 touched down on June 8, 1976, and managed to take two photos with one of its two cameras before succumbing to the heat and pressure at the surface. This is again, not coincidentally, just 11 days before the US Viking lander would touch down on Mars. They call it the space race for a reason. The US and USSR were always competing for any sort of good news. Venera 9 revealed a rocky, uneven surface and a tiny glimpse of a hazy Venusian sky. Venera 10 also successfully photographed the surface, showing lava rocks and evidence of rock weathering. As with Venera 9, only one of the cameras functioned as planned. Due to the pressure at the surface and the limits of the technology, the single photos each took up to 30 minutes to be sent from the probes to the waiting satellite relays, where they were then boosted and sent onto Earth. As a result, the images are just 64 kilopixels. That's 128 pixels across by 500 down. Compare that to the typical resolution on a modern smartphone, which is 48 megapixels, well, that's about 750 times more data. Still, there was something of a miracle that these cameras even worked and got their images into space. Venera's 11 and 12 were not so successful. In both cases, the probe failed to deploy their cameras as lens caps were not released upon landing. So, were the Soviets done probing the surface of Venus at this point? Well, no, of course they weren't. Now the USSR wanted the ultimate souvenir from the hell world of Venus, a color photograph of the surface. Venera's 13 and 14 were sent in 1981 and 1982 to do just that, carrying cameras, microphones, drilling equipment, and seismometers to study the surface for earthquakes and volcanic activity. Venera 13 survived, amazingly, for over two hours on the surface, four times what the planners had hoped for, and returned a trove of data, including color photographs, audio recordings, and an analysis of the fine-grained regolith under the lander. The microphones were able to measure the wind speed at the surface, as did Venera 14, though its camera was blocked when its land cap hit another part of the lander. The wind was found to gust at up to 85 meters per second, or about 300 kilometers an hour. That, combined with the atmospheric pressure, uh, would be rather like being hit by an endless tsunami if it were here on Earth. No wonder the surface appeared so completely flat and pulverized. These probes showed conclusively that indeed the surface of Venus was tectonically active with the lava flows and plate movements under its surface, but that there was not a trace of surface water, nor could there be, with temperatures hot enough to flash any liquid water instantly into super hot steam. It was here in the rush of discovery after Venera 13 that there was a bit of excitement, for in the photographs returned to the Soviet Research Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences, Leonik Sanfomialiti, a Soviet research scientist, claimed to have discovered evidence for life in the photographs returned by Venera 13. This includes a disk, a flap, and a scorpion, according to his analysis. These objects seem to be moving between frames of the panoramic image returned by Venera 13. And I guess it just wouldn't be an extraterrestrial mission without imagined aliens in the murky photographs. However, probe designers soon recognized the disk as being one of two lens caps that were designed to pop off the quartz cameras in the moments before the photographs were to be taken, and after which the cameras would quickly be destroyed by the heat. Sadly, having obtained these last photos of the Venusian surface, the USSR closed out the Venera missions with a couple of atmospheric studies and attempts to radar map the surface of Venus with Venera's 15 and 16. 
There would be one additional landing, this time a lander from Vega 2, a mission primarily designed to study Halley's Comet in 1985, and one failed attempt from Vega 1 in 1984. This time, no images were returned as it was a nighttime landing, timed merely due to the convenience of the mission coinciding with Vega's slingshot maneuver around Venus towards the comet. This mission deployed test balloons in Venus's atmosphere meant to study Venus's weather patterns. The balloons traversed a distance of over 11,000 kilometers before disappearing and helped scientists to understand Venus's weather systems. Today, sadly, the incredible achievements of the Venera program are all but forgotten, lost in the shadow of NASA's incredible series of missions spanning over 50 years, first to the Moon and then to Mars, where images and even video have continued to be transmitted back to Earth, revealing a world which, although is far from welcoming, is not the infernal hell that Venus turned out to be. Today, most interest in interplanetary travel focuses on Mars or the inviting moons of Jupiter or Saturn, where liquid water is known to exist and where perhaps life may even exist. But perhaps it's right to take a moment and savor the hope that Soviet scientists and the world once kindled at the thought of another world, one so much like our own, which very well could have turned out to be humanity's greatest discovery. Indeed, much recent research suggests that Venus may once have been much like our Earth, with oceans, continents, and maybe even life, hundreds of millions of years ago. Perhaps in another universe, where Venus is temperate and covered in life, the Earth of today would look very different than it does to us. Not divided and at war with itself, but united and devoted to the exploration and enjoyment of an entirely new twin world.